Let's say you and your best friend want to communicate in private without anyone else being able to listen in. You could come up with a code when the two of you are alone and then use that code to talk secretly in public without anyone else being able to understand what you're discussing. But what happens if your best friend isn't right next to you and instead they're on the opposite side of the world? You could try and send a code by email or carrier pigeon, but what happens if an attacker intercepts the message? The attacker would know your code and then they would be able to read all of your subsequent messages. You might as well have not bothered to send secret code in the first place. This is essentially a simplified version of a problem that has haunted cryptographers for years. How can you secretly share a code, a symmetric key, over a communication channel that isn't secure, like the internet? This is a fundamental problem with symmetric cryptography, the key distribution problem. A shared symmetric key would allow you and your friend to encrypt and decrypt messages with ease. It would give the two of you a secure channel through which data could be securely shared. But how can you privately share a key when you don't already have a secure communication channel to send it through? If you send the key over an insecure channel, like the internet, your adversaries may get their hands on it and decrypt all of your messages, making the whole endeavor rather pointless. But what other option do we have? How can you create security where there is none? With the magic of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, of course. Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and in today's episode, we're going to dive into the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We'll explain what it is, how it solves the symmetric key distribution problem, what it's used for, and a bit of the maths that underlie it. We'll also cover the security considerations, so that by the end of this video, you'll know enough about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange to be mildly dangerous. Back in the cryptographic dark ages of the 1970s, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman published a paper that built heavily on the prior work of Ralph Merkel. It described what we now know as the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, a process for securely sharing symmetric keys over an insecure channel. The paper was revolutionary. At the time, it was thought to present the birth of public key cryptography, which is also known as asymmetric cryptography. It wasn't until more than 20 years later that the UK's spy agency, the GCHQ, revealed that one of its employees had secretly developed an RSA-style public key scheme just a few years before Diffie and Hellman came up with their key exchange. In the future, we'll release a video about the fascinating RSA algorithm, so subscribe if you want to be notified when we release it. Despite being secretly beaten to the punch of developing public key cryptography, the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange was still innovative, extremely innovative for its time. Solving the symmetric key distribution problem brought cryptography into an entirely new era and opened up a world of possibilities. Cryptographers may not have the martini-drinking sex appeal of James Bond, but you could argue that their work has been even more pivotal in the spy world than any of Q's flashy gadgets. The Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange leapt out of academia and into the online world that we now rely on every day. It tends to linger under the hood, and you may never notice it, but the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange often plays a crucial role in establishing many secure connections we use every day for online banking, accessing webmail, logging into social media, etc., etc., etc. As we discussed in the intro, it allows two or more parties to come up with a shared secret, which can then be used to encrypt future messages. It does all this without sending the shared secret across the communication channels. This means that even if an attacker is listening in, they won't be able to use the information that they overhear to figure out the secret key and therefore decrypt the messages that the two parties send and receive to each other. This functionality means that the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is often used for developing a shared secret in many of the most common protocols that encrypt data in motion, such as TLS, IPsec, SSH, and a host of other algorithms and protocols. One important caveat is that the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange doesn't provide authentication. Without authentication, you can't confirm, you can't validate who you are communicating with. 
which means that Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks if it is implemented solely by itself. With this in mind, it needs to be used in conjunction with security mechanisms that verify the identities of each party, such as digital certificates. The Diffie-Hellman key exchange seems paradoxical in a way. How could you possibly establish a shared secret between two parties without sending the secret itself? Unfortunately for those of us who weren't mathletes, the answer is with a lot of maths. The good news is that we will start explaining how it works through an analogy of mixing paint. So even for those of us who slept through math class, should have a rough idea of what goes on during the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We're going to start with good old Alice and Bob. Let's say that Alice and Bob have gone a little wild and broken into a paint store at night. They have an insatiable urge to understand cryptography and play with paint and figure that the pursuit of knowledge was worth the risk. They both agree they will start with a random tin of paint. Alice closes her eyes and Bob spins her around and she picks out a tin of ruby red paint. This ruby red paint will act as the random common paint that they will both start with, both Alice and Bob. And to be clear, they publicly agree on this. In other words, anyone can know that they have decided to start with ruby red paint. They each take a measuring cup and scoop the same amount into their own buckets. They then choose their own secret color. Alice goes off and selects a nice goose turd green. <laughs> I see a lot of that color around here where I live, in Canada. She takes a measuring cup and scoops out the same amount and then adds it to her bucket, mixing it with the ruby red paint. Bob goes off to do the same thing, choosing drunk tank pink as his secret color and adding the exact same amount of the drunk tank pink to his bucket of ruby red and mixing it together. At this stage, Alice has a bucket of pretty putrid looking corn harvest brown color, while Bob's bucket contains a more subdued cabaret color. Now that their secret colors have been thoroughly mixed with the common ruby red, they can switch buckets. This exchange of the mixed colors is critical, and it's directly analogous to the maths used in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now that the colors have been mixed, neither Alice, Bob, or anyone who may be looking over their shoulders would be able to tell what the other party's secret colors were. The ruby red paint has been used to camouflage the secret colors, so Alice and Bob can now safely exchange them without their secrets being found, without their secret paint color being discovered. The next step is for both Alice and Bob to add their respective secret colors to the buckets they have been given. The result? Both Alice and Bob now have the same baby turd brown color in their buckets. This slightly baby turd brown color is their shared secret. But how did they both end up with the exact same shared secret color? If you think about it, both buckets had the exact same component colors added to them, just in different orders. The most important aspect of this system is that the shared secret, the, the secret colors that Alice and Bob came up with, is never exchanged. This means that even if an attacker watched Alice and Bob trade buckets, the attacker still wouldn't know what the shared secret was. Of course, the analogy breaks down a little when you consider that an attacker who could physically see the exchange could probably see the secret colors that Alice and Bob were choosing and mixing. However, <laughs> we're just using this as an analogy to demonstrate the overall principles of the Diffie-Hellman exchange, and it doesn't need to be a perfect to give you a rough idea of how things work. The main takeaway is that if both Alice and Bob choose a common paint, then add their own secret colors in private, they can then exchange the result in directly in front of an attacker's eyes without any fear that the attacker will be able to figure out the shared secret that both Alice and Bob then calculate privately. As we have stated, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange allows two parties to establish a secure shared secret even if they only have an insecure channel to communicate over. Now, of course, Diffie-Hellman doesn't use paint colors. It uses maths and numbers, so let's dig into the details. In our analogy, it would have been infeasible for an attacker that intercepts the exchange to separate the colors and figure out what the initial inputs had been. This is what made Alice and Bob's shared secret secure. Once you mix paint, you can't exactly undo it. Mathematically, the security of Diffie-Hellman key exchange relies on the impracticality of solving something called the discrete logarithm problem. To start with, both Alice and Bob agree on a modulus 
P, as well as a base G. These two mutually agreed upon numbers act much like the common paint that Alice and Bob started with in our previous example. P is a prime number, which should be at least 2048 bits long to ensure security. G is a smaller number, which is a primitive root modulo P. Explaining the relationships between these two numbers will take us off on a giant tangent, so if you'd like to know more about primitive roots, we've included it in a link in the description below. Let's begin by depicting this with simple small numbers. Say that Alice and Bob choose 29 as P and 3 as G. Alice then chooses the number 5 as her secret integer, A. Bob chooses the number 4 as his secret integer, B. Again, we'll, we're using small numbers for simplicity, but in reality, these would be much larger numbers. Alice then performs the following calculation to figure out the value for capital A. She takes G to the power of lowercase a mod P. The mod stands for modulo operation. <laughs> Again, if you aren't sure what these are, we have a link that covers them in the description. When we plug in all the numbers, capital A equals 3 to the power of 5 mod 29. This is 243 mod 29, which means that A equals 11. Alice can then send her value A, 11, to Bob. Now it's Bob's turn to run the same calculation, except he is trying to find the value for capital B. Using the formula G to the power of lowercase b mod P, the values for G and P are the same two numbers that Alice and Bob agreed upon beforehand. The difference is Bob's secret value, lowercase b, which he chooses to be the number 4. So we plug our numbers into the formula, giving us 3 to the power of 4 mod 29. This equals 81 mod 29, which turns out to be 23. Now that Bob has his value for capital B, he can send it to Alice. Alice then takes the capital B value she receives from Bob and uses it alongside her secret integer, lowercase a, to compute the shared secret S. She does this with a formula of S equals capital B to the power of lowercase a mod P. When we put in all of our values, we find that S equals 23 to the power of 5 mod 29. This equals 6 million 436,343 mod 29, which gives a result of 25. At this stage, Alice has arrived at the shared secret S. Now it's Bob's turn. Bob computes this very same shared secret with a formula of S equals capital A to the power of lowercase b mod P. He received the capital A value from Alice, while B is his own secret integer. This means that S equals 11 to the power of 4 mod 29. Therefore, S equals 14,641 mod 29. And magically, this gives Bob a result of 25 for S. It's magic! They have arrived at the same secret integer. Super cool. If you followed along closely, you will have also noticed that the only values that were exchanged over the communication channel were capital A, which was 11, and B, capital B, which was 23. Despite this, through the magics of maths, Alice and Bob were both able to compute the very same shared secret, which they could then use as the symmetric encryption key to encrypt all of their future messages. The Diffie-Hellman key exchange has done the seemingly impossible. It has given Alice and Bob a way to establish a secure symmetric key over an insecure channel. The Diffie-Hellman key exchange has solved the symmetric key distribution problem. Of course, there are a few caveats. The most important one being that the Diffie-Hellman key exchange needs to use much larger prime numbers in the correct ranges in order for the exchange to be secure from attackers. The small numbers we used for simplicity would be trivially easy to break. However, when the right numbers are chosen, the difficulty of the discrete logarithm problem prevents an attacker who intercepts the exchange from figuring out the secret integers, lowercase a and lowercase b, or the shared secret s. Congratulations! <laughs> You've made it to the end of the maths!
One of the interesting things about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is that it isn't limited to just two parties. If three or more parties wish to establish a shared secret they can use to encrypt their future messages, they use a similar set of calculations. The main difference is that it involves a few more extra rounds so that each participant can add their own secret integer into what eventually becomes the communal shared secret shared by all the parties. At the start of the video, we mentioned that the Diffie-Hellman key exchange cannot authenticate the parties on an exchange. This means that if it is implemented by itself, the users would be vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. Obviously, this is bad. So we need to combine the Diffie-Hellman key exchange with another mechanism that can do the authentication for us. In practice, this role is often filled by a combination of certificates, digital certificates, and the public key encryption scheme, RSA. In this scenario, each party has been issued digital certificates with, from a trusted certificate authority, and these digital certificates verify that the parties are truly who they say they are, and not some imposter. The digital certificates also contain each entity's public key, for which they have a matching private key that they kept secret. We'll make another video in the future that goes deep into how digital certificates work and how they are used. Suffice for now to say that they are used to verify the owner of a public key, which is critical for authentication over the internet. If efficiency wasn't a concern, the two parties could actually keep communicating securely by encrypting their outgoing messages with their partner's public key and using their own private keys to encrypt, or sorry, to decrypt the incoming messages. But the Achilles heel of asymmetric cryptography is that it is very, very slow, and we can't use it to send large amounts of encrypted data quickly and efficiently. Thankfully, we have the Diffie-Hellman key exchange to step in and save the day. Once the two parties have authenticated each other with RSA, they can use the Diffie-Hellman key exchange to come up with a shared secret from which they can establish a shared symmetric key. And with the shared symmetric key in hand, the communication partners can use much more efficient symmetric key algorithm like AES to securely encrypt the data traveling back and forth between the client and the server. As always with cryptography, there are a bunch of implementation considerations that we need to think about if we want to be confident in the overall security of our system. One of the major ones is that RSA needs to be appropriately padded in order for it to be secure. Another critical security concern is whether your implementation needs to protect past communications in the event that the keys become compromised in the future. This is typically of greatest concern when you're exchanging very sensitive data. And the way to mitigate this risk is by using what is known as perfect forward secrecy, which basically means changing the encryption keys frequently and automatically. And therefore, if one of those keys is compromised, only a small amount of data will be exposed. Another common variant of Diffie-Hellman is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. As its name suggests, it combines Diffie-Hellman key exchange with elliptic curve cryptography. We don't have time to wade too far into the maths in this video, but if you want us to cover this topic in a future video, let us know in the comments below. Elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uses the structure of elliptic curves to reduce the size of the keys while still providing the equivalent level of security as non-elliptic curve cryptography. To give you a rough idea of how dramatic the difference is, a 224-bit elliptic curve key size can provide the same level of security as a 2048-bit RSA key. TLS is one of the most commonly used protocols for encrypting traffic between a web server and a web browser. You will know your connection is secured by TLS whenever you notice the little tiny lock icon next to the address bar in your web browser, which symbolizes that you're connected via HTTPS, Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol. When the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is used with TLS, it can be run in three different modes, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, fixed Diffie-Hellman, and anonymous Diffie-Hellman. The most secure implementation of Diffie-Hellman key exchange is called ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. It provides perfect forward secrecy, which, as we discussed, protects past messages from a potential future compromise of the keys. Fixed or static Diffie-Hellman is another mode, which reuses at least one, if not both, of the private keys. In certain situations, it makes sense for the server side to retain a static key, but it's generally not as secure. The final mode is anonymous Diffie-Hellman, which does not authenticate either party, making it vulnerable to men in the middle attacks. So 
don't use anonymous Diffie Hellman if you're concerned about security. The Diffie Hellman key exchange can only be secure if the appropriate numbers are chosen and is implemented correctly. The value for P must be a prime number of at least 2048 bits. The value for G must be chosen from a finite cyclic group G. But <laughs> this is another example where the math behind this is a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Check the links in the description for more information. It's also important that Alice and Bob use cryptographically secure pseudo random number generators to generate the random numbers they use in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. If the numbers are somewhat predictable, it can make it much easier for an eavesdropping attacker to figure out the shared secret or either of Alice and Bob's secret integers. Another major concern was what was known as the logjam attack. Thankfully, recent versions of OpenSSL, major web browsers, and other software have all issued patches against it. The quick rundown on Logjam is that in 2015, a group of researchers realized that much of the internet was far more vulnerable to the number field sieve algorithm than previously thought. Their proposed attack involved computing three steps ahead of time, leaving just the final fourth step, which could be computed in a relatively short period. Back in 2015, 82% of vulnerable servers used a single susceptible 512-bit group. The researchers theorized that they could potentially compromise 7% of the top million HTTPS websites at the time. However, cryptographers such as Adi Shamir and Eyal Ronan, I'm sure I'm totally mispronouncing that, disputed some of these claims. While the practicality of the attack is up in the air, it can't hurt to follow the original study's proposed mitigation techniques and implement either elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or ensure that a value, that the p-value of at least 2048 bits is used. As we look to the future, it's important to consider how the Diffie-Hellman key exchange will hold up in a world where quantum computing is more practical. We mentioned that the security of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange depends on the assumption that it's infeasible to solve the discrete logarithm problem. The bad news is that the quantum computing revolution will seriously challenge this assumption. A post-quantum algorithm known as Shor's algorithm could make it practical to solve the problem at the heart of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange's security. This means that once quantum computing gets to the stage where running Shor's algorithm becomes viable, we can no longer rely on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange for securely establishing shared secrets. The good news is that cryptographers aren't asleep at the wheel, and we aren't moving towards this... Uh, Fairly significant challenge without a plan in hand. NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, is currently in the middle of a competition that aims to develop and standardize a host of cryptographic algorithms that will be secure in a post-quantum world. Quantum computing isn't likely to suddenly become practical overnight, so we probably have plenty of time for organizations like NIST and the cryptographers of the world to do their thing. And that concludes our deep dive into the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, uh, please give us a thumbs up. And if you want to be notified when we release future videos, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and let me know what topics you would like me to cover in future videos. Cheers.